chapter twenty of the subjection of isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen the subjection of isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter twenty isabel's temptation one afternoon not long after the return of the setons from their wit untied holiday the prime minister called upon isabel at her house in prince's gardens she was glad to see him with the gladness which the sight of a man who has once loved her almost always produces in a woman's mind there are few people towards whom women feel so kindly as towards the man whom they might have married but did not just as there are none whom they regard with such scorn and loathing as the man who might have married them but did not men dislike those to whom they have behaved badly even more than they dislike those who have behaved badly to them women on the contrary prefer those whom they have treated badly even to those who have treated them well he never pardons who hath done the wrong is a true saying as long as we stick to the pronoun he but substitute she for he and the line becomes utter nonsense for she who hath done the wrong not only pardons she commends she praises she rewards there is no kindness too extreme to be showered upon the injured one no favour too great to be shown to him if a man wishes a woman to become really attached to him he must not be kind to her he must allow her to be unkind to him it is part of the divinely feminine law of compensation therefore mrs seaton who had behaved abominably to the prime minister before he was ever a prime minister or she a mrs seaton cherished a sincere and lasting affection for lord wrexham and was always pleased to see and to be seen by him especially when as on the present occasion she was conscious that she had on a becoming gown she was too true a woman to flirt after she was married and she was much too true a woman not to want to do so the consuming passion to attract which is so incomprehensible to the women who do not feel it and so irresistible to the women who do was bred in the very bones of isabel when she ceased to feel it she would cease to breathe as for lord wrexham to him isabel was the only woman in the world and always would be but he had loved her far too well to make love to her now that she was another man's wife the bitterest day of his life had been the day when she wrote tekel across his name nothing had ever made up to him for that true fate had thrown into his lot certain ingredients which are supposed to compensate for a good deal in the lives of men notably the premiership but nothing had ever compensated him for the loss of isabel and nothing ever would he fell towards fate as we all feel towards that mysterious entity in shops called sign who comes forward after we have finally discovered that the article we want is not in stock and endeavours to persuade us that we really did not want that article at all but something absolutely different of which the shop is full for instance if we had asked in vain for black astrachan he begs to be allowed to fill the aching void with yards and yards of pink calico if we have found our prayers for knitted golf jerseys ruthlessly denied he attempts to fill our empty arms with silk umbrellas at cost price fate had treated poor lord wrexham very much the same as the being called sign treats us all in our season he had asked for isabel carnaby and fate had given him the prime ministership not by any means the same thing and he felt as we all feel in like circumstances both impatient and ungrateful i am very glad you are at home he began as i have something particular to say to you i came late in the hope that i should find you in and alone in that case you should have come early retorted isabel as a rule the later the hour the larger the meat you remind me of a very worthy girl i once knew she was apologizing to me for being married in lent and she said that as so many people seemed shocked at her being married in lent she had put off her wedding until the very last week wrexham smiled 
it always charmed him to hear isabel rattle on in her old inconsequent way nevertheless events have proved the wisdom of my course i have found you in and alone because nothing happens except the impossible and you should never expect anything but the unexpected or foresee anything except the unforeseen that is the wisdom of life then i will follow wisdom said lord wrexham and certainly her ways are ways of pleasantness when they lead me here you don't want to follow her wrexham she dwells with you it is not often that she avails herself of official residences but for the time being she has certainly taken up her abode in downing street lord wrexham fell in with isabel's mood i hope she will take up her abode there again when it is mr seaton's turn to occupy one of the official residences he never spoke of paul without the prefix mr it was the only sign he made of not having forgiven isabel's husband for having married isabel also he never addressed her by any name whatsoever the natural man kicked at having to say mrs seaton and the spiritual man hesitated at calling another man's wife by her christian name in many ways lord wrexham was very old-fashioned isabel shrugged her shoulders not she wisdom won't be dans cette galere but i shall and i shan't make a bad understudy in the enforced absence of the real article certainly you will not you are by far the wisest woman that i ever met as well as being the most brilliant isabel shook her head no i'm not not the wisest i mean i'll give in to you about the most brilliant but i'm not really wise wrexham that is why i admire it so much in you you'll find as a rule that the people we all admire most are the people who really are what we ourselves pretend to be i do not agree with you i consider you extremely wise and i think you should use your wisdom for the benefit of your husband and his followers i know that you and i are one in thinking that they are going too fast and that in grasping too much they will lose everything and i feel that it is for you to influence the advanced section of the party through your influence with your own husband you know as well as i do that there is nothing that mr seaton would not do for you and i want you to use that power in order to save the party from being first disintegrated and then destroyed lord wrexham was far too just a man not to admit to the full his rival's excellence as a husband and a politician again isabel shook her head but that's just what i don't want to do i would give anything to convince paul that i am right and that he is wrong with regard to the present political crisis which according to you and me isn't a crisis at all and shouldn't be treated as such but i couldn't bear to do what he thought wrong and i thought right just to please me which is what he is quite capable of doing wrexham looked puzzled as long as a drag was put on the liberal wheel he did not see that the inner machinery of the drag used was a matter of much moment you see isabel went on confidentially it is like this a man will do anything that a woman asks as a favor and nothing that she advises as the wisest course if she begs her husband to stand on his head just to please her he'll be found for hours together wrong end uppermost waving his feet aloft as if he were a pigeon in a pie but if she tries to prove to him that the head is a safer mode of locomotion than the feet and that he will be acting more wisely if he adopts it as such that man will stick to his own feet as long as the world stands and won't even go to the antipodes for fear he should thereby seem to be following his wife's superior advice and walking upside down oh i know them and isabel sighed over the weaknesses of the stronger sex well that makes everything more easy for you said the prime minister endeavouring to follow the thread of her argument no 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 it doesn't just the very opposite that way of managing a husband is quite the best way in domestic politics no home is complete without it but it doesn't do in really big things it is too great a responsibility for the woman don't you understand it is the knowledge that paul will do anything that i ask him which often keeps me from asking anything of course it is excellent to have a woman's strength but it is dangerous to use it like a woman i think i begin to see what you mean replied wrexham slowly isabel babbled on 
i do hate a bossy kind of wife the sort that makes her husband's mind up for him and then sees that he doesn't change it that isn't playing the game now i always pride myself on never doing anything that i can't do really well that is why i never play the violin or talk to young girls i am sure you could do both extremely well there was not much that wrexham did not believe could be done excellently by mrs paul seaton no i couldn't therefore i don't do them at all but you'd be surprised at the things i've done well in my time isabel added naively i should not that i can swear yes you would i've been surprised myself and you can't think better of me than i do i remember once mrs gaythorne made me go to a village dorcas meeting with her and you should just have seen the flannel petticoat that i made it was a perfect dream i can well believe it well then you see having laid down a rule that i would never do anything unless i could do it well i did not marry without making up my mind to be one of the best wives that ever hopped through a wedding ring and the best sort are not the bossy sort and it's no good pretending that they are the moment isabel had delivered herself of this statement it occurred to her that it was not quite the happiest thing imaginable to have said to her present company but being a woman of the world having said the wrong thing she stuck to it the crowning mistake of conversation is to show that one knows one has made a mistake just as nine times out of ten the greatest insult one can give is to offer an apology so she went gaily on therefore having become a past mistress in the fine art of being a good wife i cannot debase my art by using it for unworthy purpose art for art's sake is ever the motto of true artists be they artists in word or in colors paperers or painters so to speak and art ceases to be art when it becomes a means and not an end isabel had succeeded in covering her retreat neatly yes yes doubtless you are right at any rate i am sure you know best as to how far you are justified in influencing your husband's political life but that is not really what i came to say to you this afternoon there is something else and what is that something very interesting i hope it is something which concerns yourself and therefore is of supreme interest to me thank you Rexham. you always put things so nicely that one is apt to forget you are a prime minister the long and short of the matter is this continued lord Rexham, in his slightly ponderous manner on account of his health graves end has had to resign the governorship of tasmania and i want to know if you would like me to offer the post to your husband isabel gasped it is always a little overpowering suddenly to find one's heart's desire within one's grasp that is what i really came to say to you added wrexham but why say it to me and not to my husband isabel was herself again the impertinent self which could ask such pertinent questions wrexham began to explain in his usual somewhat laborious fashion because owing to certain reasons which i need not enter into now it seems probable that the liberal party will continue in power and you must understand it is not customary to offer a colonial governorship to a man who is sure of a seat in the cabinet before long it looks too much like shelving him then why shelve paul was the quick rejoinder of paul's wife that is just what i am endeavouring to explain to you because i happen to know that you would very much like this appointment and because it is you who are my friend not mr seaton i only feel an interest in him because he is your husband he meant that he only felt a hatred for paul because isabel was paul's wife but that was neither here nor there it is your pleasure and happiness that concern me he went on not mr seaton's my happiness is bound up with my husband's said isabel haughtily the woman was suddenly merged in the wife and for a moment she almost hated wrexham then so far as it is mr seaton's wishes are of supreme importance to me replied wrexham with unfailing courtesy and if you wish it i will offer mr seaton this appointment at once no 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 wait a bit don't be in such a hurry i want to think isabel spoke impatiently she had noted the mister and knew the social exclusiveness which it implied 
and the moment of hatred was prolonged into two believe me i would not hurry you for anything i will leave you to think the matter over and you can send me a line in a day or so just yes or no will be sufficient i shall understand said the prime minister rising from his seat no no don't go stay here i can think it over just as well in a few minutes as in a few days in fact better i never make a mistake except through caution just as you like my time is at your disposal replied wrexham with his usual old-fashioned politeness and straightway buried himself after the manner of the babes in the wood in the sweet green leaves of the westminster gazette isabel got up from her chair and went to the window at the far end of the back drawing-room where she stood looking out upon the gardens in the rear of the house it was a tremendous temptation and she recognized it as such not only would she herself have the sort of life she liked best but if she accepted wrexham's offer paul would be saved from making those mistakes which she felt convinced he would make as soon as he became a cabinet minister the country was not ripe for the reforms proposed by paul and his section of the party would not be ripe for some years to come and the liberal majority which owing to the turn affairs had taken now seemed probable at the next general election would be speedily turned into defeat by the oft-repeated radical error of plucking the apple before it was ripe and then where would paul and his followers be deeply buried under the onus of having broken up the liberal party and restoring to power the present opposition just now the government majority was so small that nothing vigorous in the shape of reform could be contemplated but when the hands of the radicals were strengthened as there seemed every likelihood that they would be after the forthcoming dissolution there was no revolution too immense no mistake too egregious for them to attempt to effect thus mrs seaton reasoned and felt that it was her duty as well as her pleasure to accept the prime minister's offer and so to save her husband from himself of course there was the bare possibility that paul might be right and she wrong with regard to what was best for the country but that possibility seemed so very remote that she speedily dismissed it from the line of argument but on the other hand there was paul himself with his own hopes and desires and wishes what right had she to frustrate these hopes even if she believed them to be delusive what right to disappoint those wishes even though they might be opposed to hers there was no doubt that his political position was strengthening every day a year or two ago the possibility of his having a place in the cabinet was frequently hinted at now the possibility of a liberal cabinet being reconstructed without him never occurred to anybody and even if her foreboding came true and his reign was doomed to a swift and suicidal ending he would still have been a cabinet minister and that is something in a man's life in fact the only thing except herself that paul had ever set his whole heart upon and had she any right to stand between him and the realization of his life's ambition any right to stand between him and the fulfillment of his heart's desire she knew that he would at once accept the colonial appointment if it were offered to him she had no doubts upon that score had she not once said that she wished for it and were not her wishes always paramount with him she was well aware that unselfishness was one of the strongest elements in her husband's character and that he carried it to such a pitch where she was concerned that her happiness was really and truly his that his could not exist apart from hers but how far was she justified in taking advantage of this deep and passionate and selfless affection even if she believed that she was acting for his good as well as for her own the very plenitude of her power made her pause before exercising it all these thoughts raced through her mind as she stood looking out upon the trees in the garden and lord wrexham studied the pages of the westminster gazette then suddenly there came into her head a conversation she had once had with poor gabriel carr about the sanctity of marriage and stray phrases from the marriage service rang in her ears wilt thou obey and serve him did that mean wilt thou so order his life that he shall have no voice in the matter that this woman may be loving and amiable faithful and obedient did this mean may she have such a strong will of her own that her husband for the sake of peace will always give in to her for the husband is the head of the wife 
did that convey the idea that it was hers to command and his to submit hers to express a wish and his to carry it out ye wives be in subjection to your own husbands was this an apostolic rendering of the modern notion that it is a woman's right to take her own way independently of the man she has married and to live her own life utterly regardless of him and as these thoughts rapidly chased each other through her active brain isabel knew for a certainty that she would reject wrexham's offer it was the only course open to her as long as she regarded her marriage as a sacrament and her husband as her lord and master divinely appointed there was no alternative subjection might mean all sorts of things but it could not possibly mean having one's own way at all costs and in defiance of all authority if she attempted to prove that it did not a dictionary in england would support her as she herself had said she could make up her mind as well in a few minutes as in a few days and she had made it up it's no good wrexham she said as she came back into the front drawing-room i can't accept it was nice of you to think of me but the thing is impossible just as you please lord wrexham's manner was as ponderously polite as ever it was impossible to tell from the expression of his face whether he approved or disapproved of mrs seaton's decision i can't put my interests before paul's in that way it would be too horrid of me i thought you said they were identical lord wrexham always experienced an indulgent pleasure when he convicted isabel of inaccuracy isabel drew herself up i said that our happiness was identical if you do quote you should always be careful to verify your quotations especially if you use them to point morals or to adorn tales wrexham took his snubbing quite meekly he thought that he had deserved it but he did not think that paul seaton had deserved the happiness which was identical with isabel's and he never would think so however long he might be prime minister of england a few nights after this when paul and isabel were sitting together after dinner preparatory to paul's going back to the house isabel said what's the matter paul you've been so quiet all through dinner that i feel sure something must be the matter with you but i didn't like to ask before the servants if it was an ill-digested foreign policy or merely an ill-digested meal has anything vexed you really well darling it has and it hasn't what a statesmanlike answer go on well my own if you want to know the truth it is this you remember once saying to me that you should like me to be appointed governor of tasmania in gravesend's place if he resigned don't you isabel remembered only too well and intimated as much as she came and sat on the arm of her husband's chair while he enjoyed his post prandial cigar well then continued paul i was wrong in imagining that wrexham might offer it to me that's all gravesend has resigned and wrexham has given the place to lord bobby thistletown and you are disappointed oh paul there was positive anguish in isabel's voice surely her great renunciation had not been in vain after all only on your account my sweet i thought you wanted it and paul's arm stole lovingly around his wife's waist and didn't you want it yourself there was still anxiety in isabel's blue eyes i for myself good gracious no but i want everything that you want sweetheart as i can only find my happiness in yours you know that well enough but you wouldn't have wanted it if you hadn't thought i did you are quite sure of that isabel persisted good heavens no how could i it would have been the final shelving of me and the end of my political career but all the same i should have taken it if wrexham had given me the chance because i thought it would please you isabel laid her cheek tenderly upon the top of paul's head then that would have been very wrong dearest very wrong indeed your wishes ought to regulate our lives not mine yours will however as long as i am master in my own house i can tell you that well they oughtn't to well they will i don't think that this is the proper way of bringing a wife into subjection to her own husband paul laughed subjection be hanged your happiness is my first object and always will be it makes me far happier to see you happy than to be happy myself if you will excuse the bull 
in fact i can only be happy through you so that it is really the height of selfishness on my part to do the things that give you pleasure isabel nestled up to him you are quite the nicest husband that was ever invented she whispered it was a happy find of mine when i chanced upon you not so lucky as mine by a long way answered paul kissing her but about this tasmanian business are you disappointed my darling because if you are i shall never forgive wrexham as long as i live for not shelving me no i'm not a bit disappointed paul i've changed my mind since that time i talked to you about lord gravesend i'd much rather see you a cabinet minister than a colonial governor i'd much rather see myself one i can tell you that replied paul with a huge sigh of relief it was such a comfort to him to find that isabel had not cared about that tasmanian appointment after all but what about yourself my sweet i thought you had set your heart upon being an excellency so i had but i've changed my heart i mean my mind and now i'd far rather be a cabinet ministering angel than a colonial governess if these are the proper terms for the wives for those offices well i'm very glad to hear it said paul kissing her again exceedingly glad i can tell you for much as i should like to be in the cabinet it would be no pleasure to me if it didn't please you as well but you really would enjoy it for yourself wouldn't you rather my only fear is that i am not a big enough man for the place oh you are big enough for that replied isabel coolly you are what i should call ordinary cabinet size but it would please you too wouldn't it my darling paul persisted it would it would please me most tremendously answered isabel and as she thrilled at the touch of her husband's arm round her she knew that she was speaking the truth after paul had gone back to the house she went up into the drawing-room and stood with her elbows on the mantelpiece looking thoughtfully down upon the mass of flowers which filled the unused fireplace i have done the right thing she said to herself there's no shadow of doubt whatever upon that score the poor darling would simply have jumped at that silly governorship if wrexham had offered it to him just to please me and it would have spoiled the rest of his life for him poor dear it was my turn to give way this time and never to let him know that i had done so it would be all spoiled if he were to find out that i had given it up for his sake so he never must i really think that i am on all fours with s peter as to the meaning of the word subjection this was the sort of thing he had in his mind at the time this or its roman and jewish equivalent but nevertheless she added with a sigh as she glanced at herself in the mirror of the overmantel i should have dearly loved to be an excellency it is after all the only really graceful way of growing old End of chapter 20chapter 21 of the subjection of isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the subjection of isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter twenty one captain gaythorne's horsewhip captain gaythorne was intensely unhappy there could be no two opinions as to that and his misery was beginning to show itself in his countenance and bearing his ruddy complexion was fast losing its claim to that epithet and his round face was growing pinched and haggard his mother did not notice his depressed spirits and changed appearance she was just then so fully occupied with a scheme for sending out the sunday at home of yesteryear to the inhabitants of the south sea islands that she had no time nor attention to spare for domestic and family matters moreover mrs gaythorne had a great deal of the masculine element in her cast of mind notably that power usually the prerogative of the stronger sex of steadily refusing to see a thing at all for a long time and then as persistently declining to see anything else the natural and normal man either believes that his nearest and dearest 
are as behemoth in their strength or else he beholds the very jaws of death gaping to receive them he knows no middle course for the treading of the feet he loves between the path of the young heart upon the mountains and the via dolorosa that leads direct to the grave and in this respect mrs gaythorne was one with the normal man fabia saw what was wrong with her husband but she hardened her heart and did not care she was in a chronic state of irritation against him and there is nothing so hardening to the heart as irritability to use a horrible and popular expression of the present day charlie got on her nerves and a woman who is capable of allowing things to get on her nerves is capable of anything our grandmothers bless their memory did not allow things to get on their nerves either their husbands or things of less importance they knew the devil when they met him and therefore did not confuse ill temper with ill health nor call by the euphonious name of nerves the ungoverned passions of their own sinful hearts it is one of the devil's latest and most successful disguises that of the irresponsible and neurotic invalid the pose termed neurasthenia has completely thrown into the shade his old make-up of the angel of light as it not only deceives the victims of the performance but takes in equally the performers themselves and there was something if not much to be said on fabia's side charlie simply adored his wife but he did not take the trouble to understand her a not uncommon mistake among those who like the apostle peter are themselves married men charlie had cut and dried rules as to what women liked and what women did not like and he regulated his behaviour towards each and every member of the sex accordingly he had a deeply rooted conviction implanted by his father and cultivated by his mother's fostering care that the more a man permitted a woman to trample upon him the better that woman was pleased and therefore he persistently made himself into a door-mat under fabia's feet without pausing to consider whether this was the conjugal attitude most likely to suit her particular requirements charlie's rule of conduct was to do and to say everything that he thought would please his wife so far so good but he made the initial mistake of omitting to discover in the first place exactly what would please her in which error again he did not stand alone if he had worshipped fabia less and understood her more things would have been better for both of them and all this misery might have been averted but a firm conviction is hard to uproot especially if it be implanted in the mind of a man and most especially if it happen to be an incorrect one there is an innate loyalty in the masculine nature which makes it cling to wrong impressions as it would cling to lost causes it seems somehow rather shabby to throw them over simply because they happen to be unfounded this trait which is not without its excellencies is a survival of mediaeval chivalry and accounts for much that is otherwise difficult to understand in the sons of men therefore if charlie were miserable fabia was miserable also and let conventional moralists say what they will there are few things more selfish than misery it is the happy people who are the kind and unselfish people and it is quite right that they should be so it is not when our own pockets are empty that we see to the replenishing of our neighbours it is not when our own teeth are aching that we accompany a friend to the dentist's with regard to suffering although not with regard to sin 
we have neither the time nor the inclination to remove the mote from our brother's eye until the operation for the beam has been successfully performed upon our own fabia gaythorne was bored to extinction the dullness of her life was well nigh killing her and the truth that having chosen her own lot she was in duty bound to make the best of it in no way affected the fact that she neither made the best of it nor even attempted to do so life without love is far too dull for the majority of women so as a rule with their usual power of adaptation failing the real article they invent a substitute which is often as difficult to distinguish from the real thing as is elkington's best electro from solid silver the hallmark being in cipher and known only to the gods mortals are only able to differentiate between the two when the electro begins to wear off and that rarely happens until it is too late to change the plated goods of course ennui is no excuse for wrongdoing but it is often a reason for it it is the idle hearts as well as the idle hands that are supplied with occupation by satan the one person who saw charlie gaythorne's misery and was made wretched by it was isabel seaton how she wished she had never invited fabia to england at all and how she wished she had left a few stones unturned in her efforts to bring about a match between fabia and captain gaythorne if wishes were horses isabel would have had a fine stud but as it was they were now absolutely useless charlie had married fabia and fabia was breaking his heart and unless isabel were much mistaken fabia would soon break up his home also isabel was not the sort of woman to believe in platonic friendships unless she happened to have any special reason for professing that article of faith she was too fond of admiration but she knew that if such friendships did exist the contracting parties were rarely if ever newly and unhappily married women and their recently rejected lovers of course there was the case of herself and wrexham to prove the contrary but she was nearly forty and wrexham fifty-nine while ram chandar was in the prime of life and fabia only twenty-three time not only heals many sorrows it also obviates many dangers then again lord wrexham was an englishman and a gentleman and dr mukharji was neither the one nor the other as his treatment of isabel's appeal to him had proved moreover isabel was passionately in love with her own husband while fabia utterly despised hers therefore the intimacy between fabia and her cousin was not to be classed in the same category as the friendship between isabel and lord wrexham and as mrs seaton contemplated what the end of the mad folly on the part of fabia would probably be her heart was very heavy indeed the visit to paris had done no permanent good the relief it afforded had only been temporary as soon as fabia returned to london her visits to the rooms in mount street became as constant and as prolonged as ever in vain her husband besought her to go back with him to gaythorne in vain he suggested another trip abroad fabia was as immovable in her decision to remain in london as she had been in her decision to return to it from paris charlie felt that he could not speak to her about what was filling his thoughts nothing would induce him to do such a thing his chivalrous nature revolted at the bare idea of suggesting to his wife that her relations with another man were too intimate all that he could do was to have it out with the other man himself therefore the only course open to him was to go direct 
to dr mukharji's rooms and tell the popular charlatan what he thought of him and the instrument which appeared most to lend itself to the appropriate and adequate expression of this opinion was a good old english horsewhip there were many reasons why the horsewhipping of dr mukharji appealed strongly to the taste of captain gaythorne in the first place charlie hated the hindu because the latter had once wanted to marry fabia and no man really likes the other men who have wished to marry his wife in the second place charlie was far too normal and healthy-minded an englishman to entertain anything but disgust and contempt for any juggling with the supernatural he disapproved of everything of the nature of occultism spiritualism or prying into the future classing them all together in his own pellucid mind under the generic term of rot and thirdly charlie loathed dr mukharji because he held the latter entirely responsible for the present state of affairs fabia was young and inexperienced but as he argued and argued with some reason mukharji or as he called him that confounded nigger was old enough to understand the irreparable mischief he was causing by allowing scandal to associate his name with that of his beautiful cousin thus charlie hated ram chandar with a threefold cord of hate and decided to deal with his enemy as it pleased him fabia and her husband were sitting together at breakfast one morning close upon the end of the season it was always fabia's habit to rise early she had learnt it in india and the english custom of getting up late never appealed to her neither did she enjoy having her breakfast in her own room with nobody to talk to save her old ayah sadie who now fulfilled the part of maid to her she liked life and society she hated solitude and dullness and although she found charlie dull enough still even he was better than the ayah who never did anything but echo all that her mistress chose to say charlie did not do very much more it must be confessed but mrs gaythorne did that dear woman never erred on the side of being too subservient to anybody on this particular day however the cries of the south sea islanders for disused sunday at homes had apparently become so importunate that mrs gaythorne had risen while it was yet night to attend a breakfast meeting which had been organized in order to satisfy the spiritual hunger of the heathen abroad and the more physical necessities of their committee at home how are you going to amuse yourself to-day my pet charlie asked he felt a horrible suspicion that his wife was going to see her cousin but hoped against hope that she was not fabia sighed wearily how am i going to amuse myself not at all i may try various means for the securing of that end but it is a foregone conclusion that they will none of them prove successful charlie's kindly face at once assumed an expression of sympathy he pitied fabia profoundly for having married a fool but he did not see how the evil was to be cured poor old girl i wish to goodness that i could hit upon something to amuse you i wish to goodness or even to badness that you could you don't seem to feel any interest in the sort of things that i talk about poor charlie's voice was very wistful fabia raised her delicately pencilled eyebrows does anybody it was extremely rude of her but charlie was very patient too patient for the type of woman with whom he had to deal i wish i could talk about things that you are interested in fabia dear i wish that you could it would make a considerable difference to me but other people can i'm not the only person in the world fortunately not even then 
the worm did not turn now there's isabel seaton don't you know a rattling good sort of woman surely she is interesting enough for anybody i never knew such a woman in my life for talking about thoughts and feelings and rot of that kind and all the sorts of things that women go on about for hours and hours together you ought to like talking to her o oh girl when she talks rot thank you the gentle charles hastened to eat his words by jove i didn't mean that when i say rot i don't mean rot i only mean that women like talking about a lot of highfalutin and sentiment that men poor brutes are much too great asses to understand and if you're on the highfalutin sentimental warpath mrs paul seaton's your man still it is possible that an undiluted and age-long tete-a-tete with isabel might pall in time especially upon another woman perhaps it might though hardly upon another man if that man happened to be seaton i never saw a beggar so cracked on his wife in my life and after being married all this time too he isn't like a husband he's more like a fellow that only meets his best girl once in a way and has to make the most of it he never looks at anybody else when she's in the room and he is always straining his ears to hear what she is saying and charlie laughed aloud at the memory of paul's infatuation there is always so much more humour in a thing done by some one else than in the very same thing done by ourselves our mere performance of an act at once robs that act of humour and clothes it with dignity in our own eyes i thought you approved of that sort of thing said fabia coldly you once told me that your father laid great stress upon the sanctity of marriage so he did by jove so he did he was a tremendous stickler for it i should think he did lay stress on it just a few rather then why laugh at mr seaton for practising what the late mr gaythorne preached i am not laughing at him i admire the fellow for it most tremendously i can tell you but somehow it seems a bit rummy for an old fellow of that age to be so deuced spoony don't you know why if he's a day he must be forty and though the fair isabel is a duck she's no chicken and charlie laughed again in the insolence of youth at his own wit and the seaton's folly fabia smiled too it struck her as so distinctly comic for her husband to be laughing at the seatons and good-humouredly tolerating them then i gather that your late father would have commended the admirable seaton great scott yes just a little i commend him myself he's not a bad sort good old paul but as for my father you should just have heard him on the subject of how husbands ought to obey and reverence their wives and so they ought they're told to in the bible or something on the same lines don't you know i'm a poor hand at quotations but i fancy that's the idea it is a good thing that mrs gaythorne is not present or she would make you look it up in the commentary after breakfast by jove so she would the dear old mater never can bear me to be shaky about the hang of a text she likes it all cut and dried and committed to memory i remember once when i was a little chap there was a harvest thanksgiving at a methodist chapel the place where she went to when old catley made such an ass of himself over that psalm business and what should catch her eye the minute she got up from that face in the hat affair at the beginning but a cross worked on the beam end of the pulpit in white chrysanthemums or michaelmas daisies or some other flower of that persuasion don't you know fabia knew only too well so well that she felt it would asphyxiate her to know it any better so she rose from the finished meal and the unfinished story and left the room saying as she went you'd better put to be continued and finish the tale some other time 
serial publication is the only form possible for stories of such length as that one charlie sat quite still after she had gone for a few minutes he was too completely crushed to move then other thoughts roused him i wonder if she's off to that damned scoundrel he said to himself i expect he's come round her with his devilish hypnotism or some vile humbug of that sort and the poor girl can't resist him by jove if i were sure of that i'd blow his brains out then a sudden idea struck him great scott i'll go straight to the brute's place now and see what the skunk is up to and if i find fabia there any one who had seen charlie's face then would hardly have recognized the usually good-tempered captain gaythorne it was not long before charlie put his threat into execution and jumped into a hansom taking with him a brand new riding whip which he had only bought a few days ago but quick as he had been somebody else had been quicker he dismissed his cab at the end of mount street and walked the rest of the way another hansom overtook him but as it was going the same way as he was he did not see the occupant until it pulled up a few paces in front of him at the door of the house in which were dr mccarge's rooms and out of that hansom stepped fabia this was enough but it was not all she did not stop to ring the bell she was too much at home for that she opened the door by means of a latch-key and went straight in shutting the front door behind her and leaving her husband whom she had not seen standing stupefied on the pavement then charlie saw red his wife to possess the latch-key of another man's house so that she could go in and out undetected the mere idea of such a thing was insufferable and drove him to absolute frenzy it proved an intimacy between fabia and the occupant of that house far greater than charlie had ever insulted his wife by supposing possible if she had a latch-key to her cousin's rooms well the scandal-mongers were not so far out after all charlie was obliged to walk a little way up the street and back again in order to steady himself he knew that if he rushed straight into dr mccarge's presence he should kill the man then and there and for fabia's sake he did not wish that murder should be done but after a turn or two in the open air his frenzy of rage subsided sufficiently to allow him to present himself as any ordinary english gentleman at the fortune-teller's door and to ask in a fairly natural voice if he could see dr mukharjee he duly sent in his card so that there might be no mistake but he took care to follow closely upon it to prevent the possibility of being denied admittance he also kept his whip in his hand so that there might be no mistake about that either his first impression on seeing his enemy was surprise at the strong family likeness between the occultist and fabia mukharjee looked more like her father or elder brother than her distant cousin and his second was still greater surprise that a man as old as ram chandar should obtain so great an influence over a handsome young woman such as fabia youth is always sceptical as to middle age's power to charm it struck charlie as rather a joke that a man of forty should be able to fascinate his own wife but that a man apparently of about forty-five should be able to fascinate charlie's wife was considerably more than a joke was altogether an inexplicable mystery and a thing to be neither understood nor endured while these thoughts raced through charlie's brain the oriental came slowly forward 
with outstretched hand and a scornful smile which was the very counterpart of fabia's how do you do captain gaythorne he said in his low eastern voice which was as soft as a woman's allow me to welcome my cousin's husband to my humble lodging but charlie put his right hand behind his back to where the left one was gently fingering the horsewhip i haven't come here for any infernal palaver he replied and his face looked as nobody had seen it look except his comrades in action i have come to tell you that i won't stand any more of your damned nonsense there's been about enough of it as it is the oriental paused a moment in admiration before he answered how splendid these english people were when they were angry when he saw the look on charlie's face he understood why the english wherever they go are the dominant race then he began suavely surely fabia but he was promptly cut short by the infuriated young giant before him mrs gaythorne's name does not enter into this present conversation please remember that then may i inquire to what i owe the honour of this visit the fortune-teller tried to keep up his scornful smile but he was trembling all over he had never in all his life seen a man look at him as charlie was looking he understood now why the native tribes were in awe of captain gaythorne he was in awe of the man himself i can soon tell you that i've come to pay my little account of what i owe you for your infernal hypnotism and treachery and general damnableness that's what i've come for and if you please i'll settle my little bill at once and with it charlie showed him his horsewhip and looked like business his rage was breaking through its leash again the other shook from head to foot with sheer fear charlie saw his enemy's terror and it infuriated him still further what a coward the hound was surely you are not going to beat me with that thing pleaded the trembling occultist charlie laughed a grim laugh that was not altogether pleasant to hear but i am though i'm going to thrash you within an inch of your life for bringing your confounded fortune-telling and hypnotism and all the rest of your infernal rot into decent english houses and among decent english wives and then i'm going to pitch your miserable little body out of the window that's what i'm going to do and the sooner it's done the better i've no pity for damned scoundrels such as you and as the memory of how this man had come between himself and fabia rushed on charlie it maddened him so that he lost all self-control and seized his enemy by the throat meaning to shake him as a dog might have shaken a rat but before he had time to fulfil his intention or to bring the raised horsewhip down upon the trembling form that was struggling in his iron grasp the slender figure collapsed altogether and fell in a heap upon the floor leaving in charlie's hands a tangled mass of false black hair and beard and charlie saw lying at his feet no grovelling indian juggler but the unconscious form of his wife fabia gaythorne End of chapter twenty one chapter twenty two of the subjection of isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the subjection of isabel carnaby by ellen thorny croft fowler chapter twenty two the effect of the horsewhip dumbfoundered with amazement and hardly knowing what he did charlie shouted for help 
and the veiled attendant came rushing into the room with her veil thrown back thereby disclosing herself to be none other than fabia's old ayah sadie see to your mistress at once commanded charlie i believe i've killed her and the big man trembled now as his wife had trembled a few minutes before the mem sahib is not dead she is only fainting replied the ayah unfastening her mistress's robe and pouring something between the white lips are you sure groaned the distracted man kneeling at her side quite sure sahib see even now the colour returns to mem sahib's lips and she begins to recover consciousness then i must go said charlie rising to his feet after what i've done i am not fit that she should ever look at me again but first tell me where is the real dr mukharji there is no real dr mukharji sahib it has always been a play of men sahibs no real dr mukharji charlie could not believe his ears no sahib there is ram chandar mukharji out in india but he has never been in england at all it has been a play of the men sahibs because she found the english life so dull charlie put his hand to his head as if he were dazed and i've knocked her down for nothing it has all been my own infernal folly what a confounded fool of an ass i've been the ayah tried to comfort him like the rest of his servants she adored captain gaythorne see the mem sahib is not really hurt she is opening her eyes then i must be off and before the dark eyes had time to unclose themselves he was out of the room and out of the house at first he did not know where to go he fairly reeled with misery he had assaulted his own wife had ill-treated her so that he had reduced her to unconsciousness and he felt that the shame of this would kill him he was a branded man he had disgraced himself and his manhood and he felt he would never lift up his head again that he had attacked fabia in ignorance was not of much comfort to him for it was his own unfounded suspicion of her that had brought him to this pass if he had never doubted her this terrible thing would not have happened the hideous fact remained he had knocked down a woman and that woman his own wife the woman whom he had sworn to love and to cherish and nothing else mattered he had done the one thing which he could never forgive any man for doing and he could never forgive himself he was a blackguard and a coward and he deserved to be drummed out of his regiment there was no palliation of such an offence as his no excuse for such dastardly conduct such were poor charlie's meditations he never attempted to make any excuse for himself excuses were not in charlie's way he had done a shameful thing and he must abide by the consequences that was the beginning and the end of it of course he should never see fabia again she would not nor would any woman in like circumstances be able to endure the sight of such a brute as he had proved himself to be no she and his mother must continue to reign at gaythorne and he must go away and hide himself as best he could there was no place in decent society for such as he he did not know where to go what to do and half unconsciously his steps led him across to prince's gardens people in trouble instinctively turned to isabel her common sense and cheerful disposition made her a veritable tower of strength to storm-tossed souls and charlie felt that if any one could help him in this terrible strait it was isabel seaton naturally he clung to his mother for comfort but even the filial charlie could not but see that isabel was far more of a woman of the world than was mrs gaythorne and therefore more competent to advise him what to do in a matter of this kind and therein he was right so he went straight to isabel and fortunately found her at home and he told her the whole story extenuating nothing with regard to his own conduct nor setting down aught in malice with regard to fabia's 
isabel was one of the rare women who cannot only talk cleverly but can also listen cleverly and therefore she heard charlie's tale to the end in silence her expressive face alive with sympathy one of her many gifts was that she could always put herself in another's place and see a thing from another's point of view it is an attribute never lacking in dramatic temperaments and an attribute which perhaps more than any other enables its possessor to attain to that universal comprehension which involves universal pardon therefore she understood both charlie's and fabia's position in the present crisis and sympathized with both accordingly when charlie had finished his recital isabel did not say much she knew he had come to talk to her and not to listen and he then confided to her his intention to banish himself from his beloved home for ever and to leave his insulted and outraged wife to reign there undisturbed in his stead it was his old mistake he set himself to do the thing that would best please his wife without first setting about to discover what that thing was but isabel did not fall into this error she was considerably older than charlie and a woman at that and she made up her mind that fabia herself should have a voice in pronouncing sentence upon her husband the only bright spot in the whole ghastly concern is that it is i who have come a cropper and not fabia i'd a million times sooner know myself for the confounded cad i am than that there should be a shadow of reproach against her she is all right bless her as i might have known from the beginning if i hadn't let my infernal jealousy make such a besotted ass of me but i was a suspicious fool not fit to black her boots and i deserve all the misery that i shall get and poor charlie looked out of the window so that as he imagined isabel should not see the tears that stood in his honest blue eyes isabel remembered browning's lines would it were i had been false not you i that am nothing not you that are all and she felt that the man in the poem would agree with captain gaythorne that in this case the worst had not happened isabel's voice was very gentle as she said poor boy things have gone crooked haven't they now what can i do to set them straight again she knew perfectly well what she was going to do but she thought it much better that the suggestion should come from charlie himself wise women rarely make valuable suggestions they guide men into making them and then they carry them out it is the surest in fact the only way of avoiding masculine opposition if they are very wise women indeed they begin with a slight demur this not only ensures the carrying out of the suggestion on the part of the man concerned it ensures it being carried out with enthusiasm that's just what i'm coming to replied charlie but he did not come at once it took him all his time just then to avoid what wolsey would have called playing the woman but what charlie himself would have described as making a blooming ass of himself the wily isabel thought aloud i wonder how fabia is now that's what i'm coming to repeated charlie and this time he came i want you to be so awfully good as to take a hansom at once and run round and just see how she is and how badly the poor darling is knocked about i should be so tremendously grateful if you would and then you can tell her that she need never see me again for i'm not fit for it and once again the big tears hung on charlie's golden eyelashes of course my dear charlie she'll be very angry at first you can't wonder at that but i don't believe she will prove as implacable as you seem to imagine she'll get over it you see you didn't mean to knock her down but i did it i can't get over that and she won't either simple natures look always at results complex natures at motives therefore charlie's point of view was diametrically opposed to isabel's well all i know is that if paul knocked me down imagining all the time that i was someone else who wanted knocking down badly i should get over it 
because you are fond of seaton and fabia has never been fond of me it makes all the difference don't you see whether you are fond of a fellow or not there's nothing that a woman won't forgive if she is and precious little that she will if she isn't isabel's heart overflowed with pity for the big man looking out of the window he seemed such a boy after all and such an unhappy boy well charlie she said cheerfully getting up from her chair ring the bell and tell perkins to whistle me a hansom while i go and put on my hat and i'll run round to fabia at once and see how she is and mind if i do this for you you must promise me in return to stay here till i come back there was a despairing look on the boyish face that made isabel afraid the poor fellow might do something desperate i promise he said simply and she knew that he was incapable of breaking his word but tell her he continued that if after what has happened she'd rather i was dead i'll go abroad and shoot myself where it would never be spotted or found out she's but to give the word see i see and i'll give your message as soon as isabel had gone and there was no need to keep up any longer charlie sat down on the sofa and sobbed like a child he cried as he had not cried since his father's death for there seemed the same upheaval of all known laws the same awful transition of the ordinary and familiar things of life into some dread and horrible nightmare now as then and now as then poor charlie felt that he should never be happy again fabia meanwhile was undergoing a new and strange experience she was not long in recovering from the shock of charlie's assault upon her as he had not had time really to hurt her because she fell unconscious at his feet and in so doing revealed her identity but although she was physically none the worse for this unparalleled incident she was mentally completely changed thereby as she gradually grasped what had happened and reenacted the scene in her own mind again and again her feelings for her husband underwent a total revolution when she saw him towering above her in his righteous indignation and literally trembled at his wrath she realized for the first time that this man was her master she understood at last that what she had mistaken for the cowardice of a weak man was in reality the patience of a strong one that what she had despised as a sign of vacillating feebleness was really the outcome of infinite self-control her husband had not endured and condoned her insolence and ill-temper because he had not the power to control her but because he had the power to control himself as with her usual quickness fabia comprehended how totally she had misunderstood and misinterpreted charlie's dealings with her her emotional as well as her mental attitude towards him changed she had scorned the man whom she believed to be her slave but her spirit humbled itself in the dust before him whom she recognized as her master as she had fallen in love with gabriel when he showed himself morally stronger than she so now she fell in love with charlie because he had shown himself physically stronger than she and she fell in love all the more deeply this time because she was one of those to whom the material world is ever more present than the spiritual and charlie had not only shown himself her superior as regards mere brute force there had been a look in his eye when he imagined that he was dealing direct with dr mukharji before which a braver man than ram chandar would have quailed much less a highly strong woman such as fabia herein she showed her oriental blood and training an englishwoman would have resented the outrage to her feminine dignity even if she did homage to the virile strength which prompted it but fabia belonged to a race whose women had long lived in slavery hugging their chains and when she recognized her lord and master she fell at his feet and owned his authority loving him all the more in that he had used her roughly and treated her with contempt as long as her husband placed the sceptre in her hands she merely belaboured him with it but as soon as he took his rightful place and invested himself with the insignia of his own sovereignty 
there was no more humble and devoted subject to be found in the whole realm of matrimony than she her soul had long ago been crying out for its master and had only so far found its mate now that at last it had discovered its master it was ready to fold its tired wings in the shelter of his strong arms and there to make its permanent resting-place when isabel arrived at the rooms in mount street the ayah ushered her at once into fabia's presence the latter was lying on a sofa looking rather pale and shaken but otherwise none the worse for what had happened for a second or two isabel stood looking at her and then simultaneously the two women burst out laughing it was a magnificent hoax fabia cried isabel as soon as she could speak simply magnificent i wouldn't have believed that any woman could have taken in half london so completely i think it was cleverly done clever it was marvellous and do you mean to say that ram chandar never came to england at all never i wanted him to do so but he refused and then i thought what fun it would be to personate him and perform some of the tricks which he had taught me and it was fun glorious fun i can believe it it must have been simply killing to hear all those women's secrets and give them advice i should have adored doing it i did but what made you begin in the first instance isabel asked dullness dullness pure and simple i was so bored that i felt i must do something to amuse myself or else i should go mad and this seemed a fairly harmless and yet absorbing pastime it was brilliantly contrived and carried out it was quite simple sadie took the rooms for me and i dressed up in native dress and a false black wig and beard you see i have sole control of all my own fortune charlie always refuses to touch a penny of it or to know how i spend it and with plenty of money at one's command everything is easy the mention of charlie recalled to isabel the purport of her errand that reminds me i have come to you with a message from charlie he is simply wild with anxiety to know how much you are hurt he need not be there are some bruises on my throat but that is all i am quite right again now the faintness soon passed off fabia i have come to plead with you for him he is so mad with horror at having knocked you down that he proposes never to see you again he thinks he isn't fit and he is full of a wild scheme of disappearing altogether and leaving gaythorne to you and his mother he even says he will go quietly away and shoot himself if you'd rather he was dead but oh fabia won't you forgive him he did not know what he was doing and he is so broken-hearted about it and there were tears in isabel's eyes fabia looked puzzled forgive him what have i to forgive forgive him for having knocked you down and hurt you isabel explained and after all as i said to him he didn't know it was you what if he had known i am his wife it was now isabel's turn to look puzzled i don't see what that has to do with it don't you to me it seems to have everything to do with it surely a man has the right to do what he will with his own isabel gasped to her western ideas this was flat heresy indeed but fabia the daughter of a long line of eastern women saw the matter in a different light it was one of her inherited instincts instincts which had come down to her through the purdah and the harem that a husband is a lord and master and a wife a chattel and a slave an instinct is ever stronger than reason especially in elemental natures then do you mean to say that you don't resent his having treated you like that oh fabia resent it no a thousand times no and more than that added fabia sitting up in her eagerness a soft light coming into her beautiful eyes it has changed my whole life for it has made me fall in love with charlie fall in love with my own husband what do you mean isabel was so interested that she could hardly speak i mean that at last i see what a fool i have been and that there isn't and never was any other man in the world but charlie isabel don't you understand i used to despise him because he was so meek and so gentle and always let me have my own way and be as rude to him as i liked and i believed it was because he was weak and feeble and not a real man but i was a blind fool 
the usually deliberate fabia was now so excited that she could not get out her words fast enough they tumbled one over the other but when he thought i was a man and a man that he hated he treated me as he treats other men and i recognize him for the man he is oh you should have seen him when he said he was going to thrash me he looked like a greek god i never heard such a thing in my life isabel was well nigh speechless this oriental attitude of mind was a thing as yet undreamed of in her philosophy fabia went on when i saw him look like that i loved him loved him with all my heart and soul and strength and when he took hold of me and i felt like a reed in his grasp i simply worshipped him i thought he was going to kill me and that made me adore him all the more i shouldn't have cared if he had it would have been a splendid death to be killed by his hand isabel continued to gasp with sheer amazement this new fabia was a revelation to her mrs seaton was occidental to her finger-tips and the idea of being slain by paul's hand did not offer the slightest attraction to her now i know what he looks like in a battle continued fabia now i know why his men are afraid of him he is a splendid hero and i've been treating him as if he were a stupid child what a fool what an arrant fool i have been by this time it occurred to isabel that it might be well for the hero to learn the surprising results of his prowess she judged and judged rightly that he would be if possible more astonished and certainly more delighted than she herself fabia i am going to fetch him she cried springing to her feet fabia caught her dress no no he will never forgive me i am not fit that he should ever speak to me again after the way i have treated him why i used to jeer at him and flout him and all the while i was not fit to black his boots isabel burst out laughing it was very funny to hear fabia speaking of charlie in so much the same terms as he had spoken of her well as you say you aren't fit to black his boots and as he has just told me that he isn't fit to black yours i should advise you both to go in for brown boots in the future if you want them well cleaned and then she hurried back to the waiting charlie he started up as she came into the room how is she what did she say can she ever forgive me his questions followed each other in rapid succession never waiting for an answer it's all right replied isabel as if she were speaking to an unhappy child there's nothing to worry about she isn't badly hurt she isn't hurt at all and oh charlie the most killing thing has happened she has fallen in love with you charlie looked dazed fallen in love with me after i've been such a brute to her what in heaven's name do you mean i mean exactly what i say and then isabel told him as briefly as she could of the unexpected turn that things had taken as she had anticipated he was as much astonished as she had been in fact this good news following so closely on his recent despair was almost too much for him but he quickly pulled himself together like the man he was by jove this beats cock-fighting was all that he could say at first and he said it several times then as the effects of the shock gradually subsided he announced his intention of going with all possible speed to his newly reconciled wife go at once replied isabel who was nothing if not practical i kept my handsome as i knew you'd want one in a hurry mrs seaton you're a brick cried charlie grasping her hand till the rings cut into her fingers and almost made her scream but look here charlie she added laying her uninjured hand upon his arm don't go and make the old mistake over again you have won fabia's love by showing her that you are her master now don't go and throw it away again by behaving like her slave but i can't behave like a brute to the poor darling yes you can like a nice brute the long and short of it is charlie that you've been much too meek women don't like meekness especially eastern women they spell it with a w and despise it remember the husband is the head of the wife and must behave himself accordingly is he charlie looked doubtful so the bible tells us does it by jove well there's no getting round the bible is there certainly not i've always had a sort of notion that it was the other way on that the wife was the head of the husband and all that kind of thing don't you know but i suppose i was up a wrong street 
you were an absolutely wrong one replied isabel firmly but considering that his own mother had been the living epistle known and read of charlie she felt that she could not altogether blame him for this misinterpretation of revealed truth well i'll try and get the right hang of the thing this time cried charlie as he escaped from isabel and jumped into the cab both he and fabia were sorely exercised as to what they should first say to each other they composed reams of pretty confessions which never saw the light but when the moment came they said nothing at all but just flew into each other's arms and blotted out all their past misunderstandings and misery with kisses as a patent past eraser there is nothing equal to a kiss it will remove every stain and make things generally as good as new some people endeavour to erase things by means of explanation but these are not a success they nearly always leave a larger mark than the original one as benzine often does but kisses rarely if ever fail they clear away everything provided of course that the genuine article is used and not a counterfeit and the genuine article comes straight from the heart end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of the subjection of isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the subjection of isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter twenty three a second gabriel just at first charlie was tempted to fall into his old mistake of making himself into a doormat for fabia to walk upon and thus once more upsetting the apple-cart which had so recently regained its equilibrium but supported by isabel's constant encouragement he nobly struggled against the old man that was in him and bravely endeavoured to put on the new man of whom he himself so heartily disapproved and his efforts were amply rewarded by his wife's increasing devotion to him as she said one day to isabel when he looks particularly adoring with that old dog-like expression of abject devotion i just shut my eyes and see his face as it appeared that day in mount street and then i worship him more than ever she kept the riding-whip as a sacred treasure and fondled it at intervals the humour of which arrangement strongly appealed to mrs seaton i think it is perfectly fascinating of you to cherish a horsewhip as a relic she remarked it is so much more original than flowers and letters and ordinary rubbishy things of that kind i have got hidden away somewhere goodness knows where a spray of roses and maidenhair that paul once gave me before we were engaged and now the roses look like scraps of worn-out boot leather and the fern like dried essence of mint sauce but a relic like a horsewhip never grows old it will be as fresh a hundred years hence as it is to-day and as full of meaning fabia laughed yes the meaning is fairly obvious that's one of the beauties of it flowers want such a lot of letter press to explain their special fragrance ben jonson had to write a whole song to expound to the uninitiated that his rosy wreath smelt not of itself but thee and my aforesaid rosy wreath smells neither of myself nor of paul but of decayed vegetation but a horsewhip requires no explanation it smells of leather and speaks for itself and he who runs may read as may also he who runs away you would not have liked a whip as a relic isabel you know you would not it would be to you a symbol of all that you most disliked in your husband isabel sighed perhaps not but i wish i'd something more interesting to treasure up than dried herbage and i don't even know where that is it is so fearfully commonplace to express love by means of roses and so original to express it by means of a horsewhip not so original among the lower classes i fancy perhaps not but the whole heart of the great middle class offers itself to its respective young women by the token of roses and maidenhair and it is the love of the great middle class that is so respectable and so dull 
but my dear isabel i thought that you prided yourself upon belonging to the great middle class and upon being absolutely normal and commonplace there was a mischievous gleam in fabia's eyes as she spoke oh i forgot so i do i'm glad you remind me of it to tell the truth it is one of my favourite poses it was one of isabel's many virtues that she was always ready to laugh at herself now i come to think of it i am very pleased that the romance of my life is embalmed in the absolutely ordinary and normal form of a spray of roses and maidenhair and i shall set about finding it at once and treasuring it accordingly though i can't for the life of me remember where i've put it fabia was right the submission which was delightful to her was difficult to isabel the eastern nature loved to submit the western nature found it hard to do so yet both did it in the spirit if isabel sometimes failed in the letter and each in her own way fulfilled the apostolic injunction and now fabia no longer grumbled at the length of charlie's anecdotes on the contrary she listened from beginning to end laughing and applauding at the right moments as a good wife should even in the story of mrs gaythorne and the harvest thanksgiving she murmured responses of the correct sort at the correct places never omitting one it is always amusing as well as profitable to see a wifely wife listening to her husband's stock anecdotes the recital becomes a sort of litany wherein he takes the part of the parson and she that of the parish clerk he pauses for her responses and she utters them almost before he has time to pause and thus gives the lead to the rest of the congregation she is not enthusiastic not too much surprised or too much amused that she leaves for those of the audience if there be any such who have never heard the tale before she does not laugh herself she merely shows others when to laugh in short she uses a mental tuning fork and starts the tune for others to sing and she generally affords the same official support to the reciter of the anecdote as the clerk affords to his parish priest at the end of july the gaythornes duly migrated to their country house and there found mrs carr and her daughter-in-law pursuing the even tenor of their way uncheered by any news of gabriel it seemed indeed as if the lost rector were blotted out of existence and as if that passing glimpse in the parisian theatre were the last that would ever be seen of him by those who had known him in his former state of existence janet was very calm very resigned and her love for her husband stood the test of time and absence remaining as firm and devoted as ever she carried the art of perfect wifehood to a point not attained by fabia or by isabel they loved and honoured and obeyed men who would only be obeyed in spite of themselves men who freely and chivalrously offered the submission and devotion which they had the right to demand men who in spite of or rather perhaps on account of their divine right of kingship always rendered to the consort the special honour and the higher place the theory of wifely submission might be naturally acceptable to fabia and naturally unacceptable to isabel they approached the question from the opposite sides of two hemispheres but the practice of the thing was simply child's play where such men as paul seaton and charlie gaythorne were concerned but with poor janet it was different she had sworn allegiance to a monarch who had vacated his throne as soon as he had the right to occupy it she owed her submission to a king who had flung away his crown the moment after it was planted upon his brow yet her fealty remained unaltered her loyalty unchanged she was married to a husband who had apparently repudiated her without the slightest reason for so doing and yet her wifely devotion was as deep and absorbing as it had been on her marriage day she was prepared should gabriel return to her to welcome him back as if nothing had happened and to love and to cherish him as tenderly as ever asking no questions and uttering no reproaches 
and should he never return to her to go mourning for him all the days of her life and to go down to the grave honouring and respecting his memory and then it came to pass that a great change came o'er the spirit of janet's dream for her there was a new heaven and a new earth so new and so wonderful that for a time sorrow and sighing fled away and her former miseries were forgotten in the middle of august her baby was born and she touched the high-water mark of human happiness and entered into the earthly paradise that paradise which was opened to woman after her banishment from eden and the gates whereof have never yet been closed true those gates are still guarded by the twin cherubim sorrow and suffering whose fiery swords pierce to the very bones and marrow but they are not impregnable and those blessed among women who win through those fiery barriers and reach the other side find themselves resting at the foot of the tree of life which grows in the very midst of the paradise of god to janet's delight the baby was a boy and her mother-in-law shared her joy for mrs carr was one of the people who considered that the world was made for men only and that girls and women were mere padding to bear a son was in mrs carr's mind the height of feminine honour and glory to bear a daughter only one degree more creditable than being an old maid it is not an uncommon type and it came to perfection in the early victorian age mrs gaythorne was as early victorian as mrs carr but in this respect the two ladies fundamentally differed it was the grief of mrs gaythorne's life that she had never had a daughter to train up in the way that she herself had so ably and so firmly trod and she had abundant sympathy with the regret which the immortal aunt of david copperfield summed up in the expression your sister betsy trotwood even now mrs gaythorne's mind bristled with devices whereby charlie's sister if he had ever had one might have benefited the human race a son was all very well she admitted he could fight for his country and he could follow in his father's footsteps and step into his father's shoes but he could neither conduct a mother's meeting nor regulate a lady's needlework guild and it was no use pretending that he could yet duties such as these might and probably would have been ably fulfilled by his sister if only he had had one therefore mrs gaythorne never ceased to regret the absence of that amiable and efficient young lady therefore it followed that mrs gaythorne seriously objected to the sex of janet's baby and was the more deeply rooted in the objection which she experienced more or less towards every mother's son whose advent was chronicled in the first column of the times by the peculiar circumstances of the case in the first place she argued in her own mind it was far more difficult for a woman to bring up a son than a daughter without her husband's help and in the second another gabriel carr did not seem likely to make for the comfort of those concerned in him judging from his father's recent example but janet's happiness was complete god had given to her the desire of her heart a son to fill gabriel's place and to take gabriel's name and so she was content of course she could not fail now and again to be overpowered with longing for her husband to share this new bliss with her but she was one of those rare people who really and truly have faith in god the majority of us believe in him more or less so do the devils who believe and tremble but how many of us believe in him as the great controller of all things without whom not even a sparrow can fall to the ground and yet who calleth the stars by their names that not one faileth how many of us actually hold fast the truth that our times are in his hands and that nothing can happen to us save what is ordained and permitted by him 
if we really believed this what would become of all that worry and anxiety which burden our hearts and line our faces where would be our despair for the present or our doubts for the future if we believed with our hearts what we profess with our lips that all things work together for good to them that love him according to his promise we should mount up with wings like eagles and should walk and not faint but we do not really believe it every foreboding for the future every doubt every fear are so many contradictions of his word so many slurs upon his faithfulness and thus by our own limitations we limit the power of god and he cannot do many mighty works among us because of our unbelief if thou canst do anything have compassion upon us and help us so prayed the father of the boy possessed with the dumb spirit and so we are praying to-day and the answer is the same as it was then if thou canst believe all things are possible to him that believeth there is no limit to what christ can do to help us the only limit is in ourselves the words of jesus are still sounding in our ears according to your faith so be it unto you and it is unto us only according to our faith and therefore the result often falls short of what he is ready and willing to do on our behalf through our blindness and hardness of heart we cannot believe and so we miss the blessing that would otherwise be ours and forfeit our inheritance but janet carr was so rooted and grounded in the faith that all things are made by him and without him was not anything made that was made that she accepted all the orderings of her life as direct from him and therefore never chafed nor rebelled she was as certain that the cloud which had darkened her life had been sent by god as she was certain that the birds and the flowers were the works of his hands and she knew that all things were working together for her good however hard it might be just now to understand their why and their wherefore there was much consultation and discussion over the baby's name the fact that his mother had already settled it in no way interfering with the full expression of mrs gaythorne's views upon the subject if it had been a girl she remarked as she and mrs carr were sitting by janet's sofa it might have been called after me as usual she used the capital letter in speaking of herself i approve of children being named after their godparents janet had already asked mrs gaythorne to act as godmother that lady seemed so admirably fitted to renounce the devil and all his works on behalf of anybody or everybody so it might agreed janet but being a boy there are difficulties in the way i never heard of a boy being christened eliza neither did i my dear nor should i approve of such a thing i do not like boys to be christened by girls names it savours of popery there is nothing that shocks me more than to hear of roman catholic kings being called joseph mary and mixed names like that no replied janet demurely i agree with you that eliza is not a suitable name for a boy in fact i don't remember of ever hearing of even a roman catholic king's being christened eliza i do not recall one myself at the present moment but i dare say there are plenty if we only knew romanists are capable of anything here mrs carr joined in still dear mrs gaythorne i always considered eliza quite a protestant name so suggestive of good queen bess and the electress sophia of hanover and people of that kind and i almost think that martin luther's wife was called elizabeth if it wasn't catherine and there is nothing at all romanizing in the poetry of eliza cook mrs gaythorne was pleased at this complimentary reference to the name given to her by her godfather and godmothers in her baptism yes i think there is a good protestant sound about eliza and i thank heaven for it i should not have liked to bear a popish sounding name that is my only objection to mary 
to my mind it savours somewhat of roman catholicism even when applied to a woman oh no 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 dear mrs gaythorne pray do not say that mrs carr expostulated i must say it if i think it janet failed to see this necessity but to mrs gaythorne it was paramount mary is the most beautiful name in the world continued mrs carr i remember learning a poem when i was a girl which began in christian world mary the something wears i forget exactly what it was that she wore but i know it meant that mary is the most beautiful name in the world except edith and i really don't think it sounds at all popish unless you put the prefix bloody before it i don't indeed mrs gaythorne janet was not very strong so she utterly failed to conceal her amusement i don't remember ever to have heard of a child being christened bloody mary she remarked excepting the queen of that name emended mrs gaythorne i don't think that even she was christened anything but mary i fancy the other name was an accretion janet carr do not attempt to teach me history bloody mary was her name and bloody mary was her nature from my earliest childhood i have called her by no other name and i never shall this was conclusive so janet wisely dropped the subject if i had had a daughter remarked mrs carr i should have called her margaret after poor dear aunt susan i do not quite see that eveline how could you call her margaret after a woman who was named susan because poor dear aunt susan's name was susan margaret and margaret is so much the prettier name of the two and i think it is much nicer for a girl to have a pretty name than an ugly one if it is all the same to everybody and the relations equally pleased i think margaret is a sweet name in itself and madge or maggie so nice for her own family and intimate friends and not quite so stiff and stately being shorter for everyday use if i had been so blessed as to have a daughter said mrs gaythorne i should have called her maria after my eldest sister but you said it sounded popish mrs gaythorne janet could not resist this temptation i did nothing of the kind janet carr i said that mary did but they are the same name janet carr you are talking nonsense you might as well say that eliza and elizabeth are the same name so they are they cannot be because i was christened eliza after lady summerhill and my youngest sister was christened elizabeth after aunt elizabeth latimer and our parents could not possibly have called two children by the same name besides lady summerhill and aunt elizabeth latimer were totally different people in no way resembling each other this again was conclusive so janet once more wisely turned to a side issue well for my part i don't see that maria sounds more protestant than mary it does my eldest sister was named maria this was the most conclusive of all janet felt that to go on arguing in the face of this statement was beating the air so she desisted and she was named maria added mrs gaythorne by way of further proof of the protestant tendencies of the name as if any further proof were needed after aunt maria latimer who always lived in the near vicinity of our birthplace it was on the tip of janet's tongue to ask where that was but she checked herself it seemed such a proof of historical ignorance not to know mrs gaythorne's birthplace but we are wandering from janet's point mrs gaythorne went on the question to be now considered is what are we to call janet's baby he will be called gabriel after his father said janet she spoke very quietly but the two who listened realized that the matter was settled and that further discussion was useless so mrs gaythorne dropped the subject she knew her match and what is more she respected her match when she met it the weeks rolled on and each day led to the discovery of fresh perfections in the baby gabriel no one who has not watched the growth of a little child has any idea of the wonderful developments which are new every morning nor of the absorbing interests which such developments excite in the loving mind of the onlooker there is no interest more absorbing few as much so yet it is the fashion nowadays to scoff 
at the delights of the baby world and to pretend that modern women need wider fields of thought and occupation than the house and the nursery afford let the modern women scoff if they will but let them also remember that if they would have a foretaste of the millennium here and now they must put away for a time all the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of its riches and must slip aside into that magic fairyland which lies around all of us in our infancy but of which alas we soon lose the key so that we can go in and out by ourselves no more and they cannot do this unless a little child shall lead them it was a bitterly cold evening early in the new year mrs carr had gone to visit some friends in the neighbourhood of her old home leaving janet to the uninterrupted society of her baby and janet was happy in the new bliss that had come to her although sometimes her longing for her husband seemed almost more than she could bear but she had learnt to possess her soul in patience and to wait upon the lord and therefore as in the case with all those who have thus learnt to wait he inclined unto her and heard her calling suddenly the front door bell rang and as the one servant was upstairs and the other was out janet laid her baby down on the drawing-room sofa and went to open the door herself she thought it could not be anybody but mrs gaythorne or fabia at this late hour of the day and she did not want to keep either of them standing out in the cold but it was neither the one nor the other on the doorstep stood a tall man dressed in a light suit of clothes over which he wore a somewhat flashy top-coat with a velvet collar the sort of costume that would be worn by a fifth-rate actor or a member of the swell mob janet was a short woman and the hall at the rectory was but poorly lighted so that she saw the stranger's clothes before she saw his face which was in the shadow but as he stepped forward and the dim light from the hall lamp fell upon him what was her incredible joy and gladness to recognize in this showily dressed stranger her husband gabriel carr End of chapter twenty three